There we go. All right, awesome. So it's Paul Sponsia, IT company. I feel like I've done so many videos now that I can quit introducing myself, but just in case, I'm the CEO of the IT company here in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I've been doing a series of videos with businesses and business leaders um, about different uh, responses and specifics about especially their industry. And so I'm here today with a couple of folks from Moxie Carmichael, which is a, a customer of ours too, which is kind of fun. And uh, they are a PR marketing communications firm. And I've got Lauren and Charlie here. And I'm going to let you guys maybe be a little bit more descriptive on what Moxley Carmichael does and your all's roles. Whoever wants to jump in. Well, I'm Lauren Miller. I am the senior vice president of Moxley Carmichael. I have been with the firm for 12 and a half years. I am an Oak Ridge, Tennessee native, so East Tennessee has always been home. And um, Moxley Carmichael is a full service public relations and communications firm. So we do everything from uh, communication strategy, media relations, community relations, special events, uh, writing, editing, content development through government relations, crisis communications, um, and then, of course, Charlie's part, which is a, a big part of it, which is the visual communications. I'm Charlie Sexton. I'm the creative director at Moxley Carmichael, and I've been there 19 years. Um, so it's kind of all I've ever done. Um, like Lauren said, I oversee the creative side of the shop, and we're a full service um, creative department. If it involves putting ink on a page or a pixel on a screen, our team can handle it, and we help clients with a wide variety of, of communications projects. One of the cool things about uh, Moxie Carmichael is the tenure of people. Mm -hmm. So 19 years, 12 years. Scott, I would imagine, is somewhere in between those two probably. Yeah, I think he's around 16, 15, 16. Yeah. Maybe gonna say 16. Yeah. Okay. Crazy. So, all right. So the big thing, you know, I, I'm kind of tired of probably like everybody else talking about COVID-19, but we are in the midst. It is a crisis and it does create a need to communicate. And so that was the topic of today is how do we, how do we communicate in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of a crisis? And so I'd love um, just to talk about maybe what are two or three strategies that you guys would employ um, with customers on like how do you communicate, what do you communicate, how often do you communicate, both to your customers, you know, and to your internal, because there's both that have to happen. So whoever, I think, Lauren, that's probably your specialty, I would think. It, it is. Um, so it, you know, being a full service agency where we work with a lot of different clients and a lot of different industries, um, we don't focus on any one specific industry. Um, we just don't take competitors for our regular retainer clients within each one. It, it really does depend. And, and I think that's one of the first things I would say in terms of communication during a pandemic or during a crisis. Um, of course, it's different from your day to day, but it still needs to be authentic to your organization. Now is not the time to completely try and overhaul who you are and what you do and how you talk to your customers because of external um, forces, because authenticity is still is still king when it comes to how you communicate with people. And, um, and if it's not authentic to you to be part of this conversation or to touch base with your customers every day, um, that's going to feel forced. It's not going to work. Um, and in some cases, it's going to backfire. So that's first and foremost, is us thinking about how do we communicate on a regular basis. And yeah, that might mean amplifying it or increasing it, but it's understanding where we're starting from and um, growing on that in an appropriate manner. So for us at Moxley Carmichael, we talk to our clients nearly every day. So it made perfect sense for us to jump on the phone, jump on email and say, what's going on? How can we help? Um, for other clients, it meant, okay, what are our plans? When's your next communication going out? Where do you normally communicate with your customers? Is that Facebook primarily? If you don't have a Facebook page, which some you know folks still don't, um, you know, and this is a good time to start thinking about what vehicles were you missing when you wanted and needed them? Uh, do you think about that outside of the crisis situation of adding them? But are you normally communicating via um, website, via phone call? How do we 
build upon that and make it um, work for you right now. Uh, and and I think another key part of this in terms of frequency and messaging was, all right, if we have something that's helpful to share, we need to go ahead and share it um, as quickly as we can once it's confirmed. You know, you want we want to share accurate information. Right now is a time where the public has a lot of uncertainty. Um, there's a lot of confusion. You want to be a trusted resource for information. So make sure that what we're sharing is confirmed. It's not speculation. It's not a plan that that you haven't confirmed or gotten approval on. But that being said, the public is also very forgiving right now of this is a fluid situation and it's changing every day. So we don't want clients to be afraid or organizations to be afraid of communicating, here's what we're doing right now. And that might change tomorrow and it might change next week, but we're being transparent about what we can share right now and, and uh, folks appreciate that. I think that transparency, that honesty, um, it gives them confidence not only in what you're doing right now, but the fact is that you're going to keep them updated as things change because we have all had to accept that this is um, a new situation and an ever-changing situation. You know, one thing I did notice in the process is it seemed like, especially in those first few weeks, it was like every day I was getting an email about COVID-19 and our response to it. And, you know, it almost became noise really more than anything because everybody was responding to it. So did you, you know, were there any, um, I guess, did you see anything in that process that pointed out like the things that you already knew were do not? Like you mentioned one, like is, well, don't try to change your strategy right now. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but were there any, anything else that you picked up on that was like, eh, that's a bad idea. I wouldn't do that. Yeah, there. I think that to some extent it became table stakes, right, to at least say we're recognizing and we're letting you know, hey, are we open for business? Yeah. Are we closed for business? You had to do that. Mm -hmm. But um, I did see um, just in my personal email some companies that were utilizing it to send multiple emails within a short period of time yeah. that really were trying to capitalize on sales. Yeah. To me, that felt very intrusive. Yeah. Uh, you know, I understand that you feel like you need to let me know COVID-19 means we're open for business. You can still order online. Great. That's all I need to know. If you're having some sort of a special sale, um, and I think some folks did a good job with that. Some companies said, hey, thank you for being our customer. This is a difficult time. Let's all celebrate that, you know, that we're still um, open for business and offer you a, a, a discount we've never offered before, 25% off your entire order, no restrictions. Yeah. That felt authentic to me. But if you emailed me multiple times within a short period of time just to say we're open and you can order online with no offer, no discount, nothing but trying to push and drive sales under the guise of me seeing COVID-19 in the subject line, um, you quickly got removed from my email list. Yeah, that's good. Charlie, anything in that kind of vein that we're talking about? Like, you know, I know you're more on the uh, the creative <clears throat> side, but you've been doing this for a long time too, obviously. So anything that you observed or anything that you really felt was good or not good? Yeah, I think uh, Lauren really kind of hit the nail on the head about not being tone deaf to the situation. And a lot of those, um, you know, uh, alert emails treated as marketing emails really were going the wrong way. But there were some creative um, avenues of people doing it the right way. One of our clients, uh, Sweet Peas Barbecue, um, you saw the trend where restaurants were selling off uh, uncooked meat yeah. or produce for yeah. uh, customers to take home and prepare. Mm -hmm. Sweet Peas did something similar, but they bundled um, a roll of toilet paper with every purchase, <laughs> you know, at the onset, you know, just to kind of have so fun good. with it. And yeah, some people did a great job. One of the things I know Knox County Libraries did is when they put the announcement out that they were closing, they also let people know that they were extending um, the borrow dates by four weeks, three or four weeks on each of those. So um, I know our family went and hit up the library and, and took advantage of that. So um, yeah, some people really, really got it right in their communication. Yeah. How does how does digital Charlie in your world? How do you, you know we we're six weeks kind of in? I guess four weeks of really maybe three weeks of kind of stay at home. My son was born four weeks ago, last mm -hmm. Friday. So yeah, he was born on the third Friday the thirteenth. And I remember thinking, what a world this kid's been born into. <laughs> <laughs> like, like it was just like everything just went. <laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, so we're kind of, I have it timed based on that. So we're sort of, we're really 
like seriously four weeks in, kind of really six or eight weeks in, and then sort of quarantine, stay at home like three, two, three weeks in. So you've had a chance now to sort of work with clients. So Charlie, how is digital, you know, how has that played into the equation of communicating at this point? Uh, Matt, if it, it's happening online, that is the primary source of communication and people just need to utilize the, the platforms appropriately. Um, person to person contact is non-existent right now. Um, so companies have to utilize any and all avenues that they have to communicate with their customers. Uh, early on, uh, there was that rush of email that you pointed out and your inbox was flooded with communication like that. We helped a lot of customers um, update their websites, uh, posting uh, schedule adjustments, policy changes, info about their services. Uh, now it seems most of that communication is moving through social media. Um, the average social media user is in and out of those apps multiple times a day. Now that we're relegated to our homes, social media, social media activity has greatly increased and we're social creatures. So, you know, humans want that interaction and, and right now we're, we're going to get it through, uh, um, through digital means. Yeah. Is there a platform, you know, we think about, so we have all these, you know, these platforms, we have the, the traditional, it's funny to say traditional, but Facebook, <laughs> Instagram, Twitter, you know, and now we've got these more, uh, these ones that have kind of come along with Snapchat, obviously, even things like TikTok, you know, and Marco Polo, like we have all these different platforms. You know, would you say there is a um, a particular platform or platforms that are kind of the place to go to based on what you're trying to achieve? Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, the standard rules apply. You know, what's appropriate for Pinterest and Instagram, which is a very visual platform, might not work as well on Twitter. So mm -hmm. uh, people still need to kind of stay in the lane that's appropriate for those um, that, that social media communication. I will say the meme humor has never been stronger. Yeah, um, the good right Tiger King memes <laughs> aside, there's, there's never been better meme humor out there. And uh, it's yeah. some of the best comedy around, I that's think. Dope. And uh, so you can enjoy that anywhere. Yeah. Um, Facebook is is kind of a quasi website of sorts, if you really think about it, because you've got multiple um, ways to communicate with your customers through video, photo or a written post. Um, all your contact info is there. If they want to do an email or a phone call, there's the messenger if they want instant uh, communication. So I think Facebook is one that people should definitely be uh, paying the most attention to. Yeah. Yeah. I see that with Facebook, with one of our healthcare clients in particular, we're both using organic posts, um, some um, some advertising on Facebook, as well as, um, you know, regular engagement through messaging and such. And I've definitely seen an uptick in that since Safer at Home order went into place. So folks are, like Charlie said, they're on social media. They're using that as a source of information, as a, one of their main ways of, of communicating. I think sometimes folks are even assuming, I don't know whether you're open or not. So rather than call, I'm going to send a message on Facebook first. So um, I think this points back in my mind to what we were saying earlier of having a good communication strategy before a crisis. Because if you already are set up to communicate with folks for them to know where to find you, to have a plan in place on how to engage, how to answer messages, that works for you year round. But during a time like this, it pays dividends because it's faster and easier and um, and more effective for you to engage with customers because they already know where and when to do it um, through digital platforms when face to face um, communication isn't available or where they might be making assumptions if they don't know if someone's answering the phones or not. Um, Great. You know, one thing I, th I had written down, Charlie, you alluded to one example. Um, do either of you have any thoughts on anything you've seen that if you were like, hey, if you want to see somebody that really knocked it out of the park, go look at these guys. You know, this bigger company really did a stellar job. Is there anybody besides Sweet Peas who you could think of? Lauren, anybody? Well, I think a lot of local companies have been doing a good job. You know, you've seen not only them doing a good job as individual uh, organizations of, of sharing information, but you've seen, um, I think, organizations in Knoxville come together to do creative things um, to promote with like local Love Box 
and yeah. um, Maker City doing online auctions. Um, you know, I think that those are good examples of of not only working independently to promote, but figuring out you know, like how do we pool our collective resources yeah. to um, really um, push that message farther and wider and broader, which has been really effective. Charlie, any others you, that, that really stood out to you? I think, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting in that most people are getting it right, I think. And, and we're not seeing an emergence of any clever ad campaigns at this point. We're not seeing an emergence of, um, ooh, that's, that was very, um, very well designed or the photography was gorgeous. I think the biggest and most memorable impact are those that are kind of rising up with uh, community support um, that are really taking this as an opportunity to help people, whether it's um, like prestige cleaners switching over to uh, produce masks yeah. um, or, or people finding ways to lend a helping hand um, to with food distribution or um, reminding people to check on neighbors or check on yeah. elderly friends that you have. I think it's less of, uh, th that's the new impact. It's the human touch side, human touch on a high tech, you know, uh, distribution model. Good. That's real good. Um, so we are, uh, a little ways down the road. Don't have to communicate every day or, you know, whatever it was like we did before, so how, what would you recommend to, or what are you recommending to people now as far as communication, you know, now that we're at this point, like, are, are you, what are kind of some of your, like your, your best practices at this point? Is it back to normal or what does it look like? It's not completely back to normal. I think there's a few um, kind of tried and true rules that we're still following. First one being, um, I have to say still correct misinformation. Again, there's a lot of confusion right now. And so I think there are still organizations that are dealing with um, rumors or confusion around if we're open, if we're not, if we're safe, if we're not. You know, um, I was talking with Pilot yesterday about the fact that there was a rumor going around that they they um, were not wearing masks in the stores when, in fact, they are now supplying masks mm. to their team members. Uh -huh. So that's a good example of you've got to communicate to to correct misinformation and to promote the things that you are still doing to make your business um, safe, to keep your team members healthy if you're you're open. I think that's key, especially if there's, there's um, confusion. Uh, I think the next part is um, if you have major changes still, I mean, some are still experiencing major changes. Some were planning to open and then the safer at home order was extended. You still have to communicate those uh, major changes. Um, and I think that's a good example, too, of folks are starting to think, like you said, Paul, about like what's next steps. We've gotten used to yeah. being at home and and the digital communication and, you know, either telehealth appointments with your primary care doctor or ordering online or click list for your groceries, those kind of things. But we're all anxious and anticipating when it goes back to normal yeah. and folks are wanting to know what that normal looks like. So I think it is start, you know, it is time to start thinking about that and how to start communicating that. But it goes back to the, what I said earlier about only share what you can confirm. Now's not the time to set a grand reopening event on a date and say, yeah. everyone come down, we'll be open this day and we'll have free booze. Um, yeah. I don't think you can guarantee that right now. Yeah. Um, but so so we're still telling clients, you got to communicate within the world we live in right now, major changes, correcting misinformation, reminding people of what services you have. But we need to start thinking about what it looks like when things go back to normal and how to start communicating that. It's not too early to think about it, but it is too early to make set promises on dates and specifics. Yeah. I wonder if you guys, you know, I did an interview with a, um, a guy who's a cyber warfare military expert, like just this fascinating guy. Um, it was mostly about cybersecurity and stuff. But one of the things he talked about doing was um, after action reviews. And, you know, his suggestion was do them every week right now because so much is changing and then integrate those, you know, lessons learned. So I don't, I'm not, you know, saying that you guys have had a chance of doing that, but is there anything – are there any things that you've learned so far that you're like, you know, this is something we're going to reintegrate? Like if we picked up a new client right now who said, hey, the first thing we want you to do is 
help us develop our crisis management strategy, you know? And um, so is there anything through this that you, that you kind of maybe weren't ready for or that you really sort of picked up and like this is something we would integrate in the future? Mm. That's a good question. I, I think that I've seen with some organizations how quickly they were able to adapt and others were not. And so one of the things that I would look at with clients is what is your process for how quickly you can implement change to adapt? Because the ones that were able to adapt quickly um, were able to promote those changes in their services faster. They got eyeballs on them faster. They were able to leverage things like news media faster because yeah. right at that point, if you were first or it was part of what's the conversation of what's new, you not only communicated it through your own channels and social channels, but through news media. But if you were implementing it, even at this point, one or two or three weeks later, which is not a long time, but in this world, it meant you were not first and you were not getting that added push of mm. being part of the conversation of what's changed and how are mm. companies adapting to serve you better in this landscape. So I would encourage companies to look at how, what is your structure of you may have a system or a protocol to implement change regularly, but how, how does it work in time of crisis? Um, you may have to look at how to accelerate those timelines and, and speed up your protocols, um, not to rush, but to, to be able to take advantage of the opportunity in front of you, even in a time of crisis, part of that is the speed in which you can react. Yeah. That's really good. Well, I think that, you know, it's a it's a, a little bit of a, a segue, but there, there's something that makes me think of is like there's probably few people that have crisis communication strategies. You know, there's probably a lot of people that have, well, I mean, I, I know there's not a lot of people that actually have crisis management strategies, to begin with, but, but there's probably not a lot of people that really think about, you know, a strategy. Do I have a team like you guys? Do I have people in place? Then the, in the event that there is a crisis, I can pull these people together and we know that we can figure out how we're going to communicate in that. So that's just one thing I thought of. Mm -hmm. And the second thing I thought of is just general crisis management, which it is a little bit of a segue, but you guys are both working from home. And so you, you are not immune from having to adapt and change and, you know, while your clients are adapting and changing. And so what were things that um, really made it so that uh, the change was you were able to adapt because you did it fast too. You guys didn't, it wasn't like, you know, you, you had a crystal ball and you had weeks to plan it out. You guys moved pretty fast too. So Charlie, start with you. What, what, what do you think? Uh, yeah, for, for us uh, as a team, we were, we had, we were kind of ready. Um, Fortunately, we're we're in a um, an industry where if we've got an internet connection, we can we can serve our clients. We can yeah. do what we need to do um, through, of course, your company services. We have a very solid remote access to our server, which is where all of the graphics files are, and I know a lot of the the PR files are are there as well. Um, it, it's interesting. Everybody was forced into the remote work growing pains fast. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. The, the training wheels came off fast with a lot yeah. of this. Um, I think as a communications agency, we are pretty nimble to begin with. We adapt to change, whether it's a client strategies changing or uh, a crisis develops like this. I think we're, we're a pretty nimble team to start off with. Yeah. <clears throat> One of the things that we utilized um, and got in place right out of the gate was um, video calls, Zoom. Um, you know, we got uh, equip the team with full Zoom licensing, and yeah. we keep not only our regular Monday morning staff meeting, but we added a midweek check-in. It's a condensed version wow. where we just kind of, you know, touch base on what's changed since we talked a few days ago and what's coming up. Um, it gives us time to see each other, um, which we kind of miss um, seeing each other in person. Yeah. And we've done a happy hour a couple of times where... Yeah. Um, our, our senior web developer played guitar and sang songs. Our CFO, Sean, is a great voice. And we enjoyed cold beverages where we were. And we just, you know, we're people just hanging out and sharing about what we're going through. Um, so I think a lot of people are experiencing that. And I think a lot of people are seeing value and benefit in it. I think um, w remote work uh, policies, uh, I think, are going to be implemented uh, pretty much across the board, really. Um, yeah. Because I think there are a lot of positives. 
uh, we've had a, a couple of conversations with our graphic designer, Katrina Roberts. She said, I wonder what it will feel like when when we get to choose to work uh-huh. remotely and not being forced. How's that going to feel? You know, it'll feel uh, better probably, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I would tack on to, that, uh, to what Lauren's comment was earlier about preparedness. Um, people also need to make sure that their website infrastructure is up to date and marketing assets are kind of up to date, photography, and um, you can lay your hands easily on that. Um, because I know we've helped a ton of clients um, update their websites to to be able to share messaging and add coronavirus update sections to websites yeah. and things like that. So I think uh, that's easy to defer and kind of put off as infrastructure updates like that. But but I predict a lot of companies will move that a little higher on their lists. Yeah. Good. Lauren, how about you? Yeah, I'd, I'd first echo what Charlie said. We were already in a good position. Um, you know, I regularly work from home or within from client offices or wherever I need to be working because sometimes client needs are immediate and yeah. I don't even waste the commute into the office if I've got to handle something. So having the um, the VPN, the IT company set up, having a you know cell phone, laptop that we I bring home every day, you know that felt that felt normal to me. And I, I think that you know we had to as a team figure out how to work collaboratively with those tools that we were used to using as individuals. But the fact that we were used to using them and they were already in place gave us a leg up. I saw some organizations that were having to very quickly figure out buying laptops, setting up VPN, setting up access, setting up protocols. What are the rules? Who works from home? You know, we didn't have to do all that. So I think Charlie's right that having some, regardless of to what level an organization offers or allows, um, you know, remote work uh, in the future. I think the idea of making it available in terms of just the logistics is key because if you can do it, then it allows you to do it when you need or want to. Um, So that was key. And like Charlie said, there's so many tools. Um, We use Zoom, we we use Microsoft Teams, we use Slack, we use, um, you know, we're calling each other, we're texting each other, we're using email, like all of those things allow everybody to just stay in touch. And I, I haven't found it to be overwhelming because um, right now those are our own, only modes of communication. And I think there was something that was helpful about, hey, we're thrown into the deep end, let's just start yeah. swimming and see what works. And it might mean that eventually we shed some of those tools, yeah. but right now they're all helping just keep us afloat. And, um, and that's what's important right now. And we can streamline efficiencies later. Yeah. Well, I love the two things. One is the, I've loved the virtual happy hours. We've done it. Other people, it's just fun to see people doing that. And they take pictures of it and put it on social media. So that's pretty, that's really, really cool. And, um, and I do think that you're right. Like we're, it's going to be really fascinating to see how work from home policies change. I think just the thought process, which I think is a communication strategy that's going to, have to be thought through is what happens when we do, we are able to kind of change back to the way we were companies like us companies like you guys probably don't necessarily need to communicate that the same way that a restaurant would need to communicate that or you know somebody that's more public facing you know facilities and stuff so i think that it's going to be i'm sure your jobs will get really busy again as that changes and people are like all right now we need to know <laughs> you know, what to do next, you know. Um, so, and I, one thing too that you guys said that I, that just from our side that we learned is that it wasn't the infrastructure that was difficult for people. It was the, it was two pieces. One is just the whole cultural, like I got to work from home. That was a big deal. And the other was um, a lot of people didn't know like, well, do I use my home computer or do I need to take my, like, cause they don't have laptops. So like, so do we just like rip our desktops out? You know? So what we found was as an IT business, we were really busy for those first couple of weeks because everybody was trying to figure out if they didn't have a, that laptop or whatever, what are we going to do? Like, how are we going to, I, I was thinking, Charlie, you don't, do you use your laptop at work or do you have, I thought you had a desktop too. You no, I, I use a MacBook Pro. You use yeah. a MacBook Pro? No, okay. Yeah, I, I just we had several companies that were in that situation. You know, they're they're uh, collectors. You know, and so those people they don't have laptops. You know, they're sixty desktop computers. What do you do in that situation? So, mm-hmm. it's uh, and that goes to internal communication, <laughs> you know, as well. So, 
it's uh, it's been uh, fascinating. So, yeah. Well, I really appreciate you guys. I uh, I don't have any other questions unless you guys have any last parting thoughts before we uh, wrap it up. Anything? I was just going to say, I think the other part about this is this is not normal circumstances. As we all know, like there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of pressure on mental health. People are also trying to work and parent and be teachers and do all these things. And so like, hey, if we can all work and thrive and survive in this environment, um, everything that comes after this, I think like we're, we're better prepared to to just kill it in the future because yeah. I think people are juggling a lot right now and this is not normal. It's going to be even easier and better in the future. Yeah. I feel you on that one. A four week old. It's been yeah. uh, <laughs> my, my wife, like I, you know, I, I give all the credit and props to her. She is, uh, you know, as, the, as a mother, you know, and, and the, the kind of initial primary caregiver in that first period. Um, and she's a business owner. She owns hard knocks pizza. So she's, you know, we're, we're navigating uh, some, some, sometimes some class five and class six rapids <laughs> on, a day, on a daily basis. So we're going to be good kayakers when this is over with. But, <laughs> but I, uh, I do appreciate you guys. We absolutely love working with you guys. We love you guys as clients. I'm so thankful that you could jump on a call, and I hope that this serves people. It'd be cool. If for some reason somebody sees this and they're like, I need to hire Moxie Carmichael. <laughs> I need those guys. What's the best way for them to get a hold of you guys right now? Uh, they can just reach out directly to me if they'd like, since I'm on the video. Um, uh, my, all of our contact information is on our website, moxleycarmichael.com, um, and would welcome a phone call, an email, um, however is, is best for them. You just reach out. We'd love to hear from anyone who needs help um, with a communications plan, a crisis communications plan, or any of our services. All right, great. And Charlie is a wickedly wickedly talented designer yes. so i would uh I, I definitely just he's my friend and i've seen some of his just his his just normal work that he does just for fun and it's really good so i can't i can't recommend charlie enough so well i appreciate you guys thanks again for jumping on i'm gonna stop recording once my mouse comes back alive <laughs> hold on here we go